Uh, it's really a great pleasure to introduce Nader Bakos, who is the author of this great new book, The Targeter, My Life in the CIA, Hunting Terrorists and Challenging the White House. Um, and we're going to have a conversation uh, about, about the book, and then we'll open it up to a discussion with you. So why did you write the book? Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's just get into that. Um, I actually thought about writing it uh, with a former colleague about four years ago. Yeah. And we shopped around just a little bit of a treatment, and there really wasn't that much interest. I guess it was Strange. more like five. It was in Is 2012, that war fatigue? actually. It's a long time ago. Boy. <laughs> Is, do you think that was war? It was war fatigue. That's what we were yeah. told. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and even though this, this optic had not been told, um, yeah. we had, they had declared the war over, I think, around that time. And people were moving on yeah. mentally. So, so a little bit more time went by. I met you and did a documentary for HBO based on one of your books. And after that experience, um, I started talking a bit more about doing another book. Yeah. Um, and this time, just from my optic. Yeah. And I see that it's, uh, I mean, there are no redactions. No. Which, which, is, which, is, which is interesting, right? Yes. I mean, I presume you did redact some things. I did. I tell, went... me, tell, tell us about the process. And, and for those who don't know, the whole publication review process as a former agency person, what is that like? Yeah. We sign a national security agreement, so anything that we publish, um, the public will then have um, purview to, needs to go through a, a review board, whether we are there or not. So the rest of my life, anything that you see publicly that I've written will have gone through there if it has to do with classified now, information. Some of your former colleagues, like Phil Mudd, he doesn't seem to have a problem with just going on CNN every, every night. <laughs> so, I mean, it's an interesting how, you know, how certain people yeah. like, just are very kind of careful about it, and certain people are more right. like... I mean, and Phil's it's not true. necessarily talking about what he was doing when he was at the agency, but nonetheless, yeah. I don't think he calls up the agency every night and says, look, no. I'm about to go on CNN. Well, and you also get guidance around what you can talk about. Right. So I, um, I, I was super paranoid, and prior to engaging in the documentary, I went through and had all these talking points prepared and sent those through the review process. But I've since learned really what it is they're more concerned about, yeah. um, especially sources and methods, which is, you know, yeah. at the heart of everything. But... This book was unprecedented. It took, it was stuck in review for about a year and a half. Wow. And then after that, when I got it back, it was largely just black ink. You are kidding. So I ended up having to sue the government. I filed a lawsuit just so they would sit down and talk to me about what it is they had a problem with because they weren't willing to engage in the conversation. Uh -huh. And I had to sit down not only with the CIA, which it was a much easier process working through some of the redactions with them, but also then with um, DOD and uh, other agencies. And so they all felt they could take a whack at it. Right, because there's equities in here. Um, yeah. I worked with special forces, so yeah. they, they looked at that information uh, But, too. you know, Stan McChrystal's book really, I mean, which was obviously clear by DOD, kind of actually told a lot of the Zakawi story, right? Right. Publicly, yeah. right? So that, did that make it easier? Well, it was all from his optics. So all there was, from his optic, yeah. Right. So there was nothing really from the CIA perspective. Right. He wasn't part of the run-up to the Iraq War you know, right. piece that I was. So there were, there were parts of that. But even then, I was having to, there was a struggle with trying to get released. Ha, has there ever been, um, I mean, I presume when George Tennant did his book, it wasn't such a pain in the... You'd presume, right, if yeah. it's senior level. But, you know, I'm, I've talked to several senior level people who have left and still have issues with the review process. And it's just largely broken. Yeah. I was speaking to a congressman yesterday that's actually on the House Intel Committee, you know, telling him exactly which pieces need to be fixed. Because it's a perfectly reasonable thing, but it's not reasonable to, sp to spend 18 months. Right? Exactly. So then the, there's people that will just go around it, a circuitous route. It's just not feasible to use it all the time. And would they really sue you? I'm not talking about you. I mean, in general. I mean, are there examples? There people? are examples of the DOD suing people. We know. Well, um, certainly the, the 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 Bin Laden book. The Bin Laden book. Yeah. The first one. Yes. Uh, I don't know. Are there examples of the CIA suing people, Lockie? <laughs> this there one. Is, there was, okay. There was a rather famous one from the 80s. Was that? Oh right. That's right. Yeah. So tell us uh, how you arrived at the CIA. Not what vehicle, but... 
you know, what, what, how did you get there? I mean, uh... um, a circuitous route. I started out in Montana. I ended up just applying just because I wanted to live overseas. I wasn't thinking, oh, I really want to live or work at the CIA. Um, I was in my late 20s, early 30s. So I thought that was probably the best option. And what, what year was that? That was 1999. So pre-9-11. Yes. And in fact, this was a period when I think at the farm in 95, it was like the lowest number of recruits right. in the history, right? Right. Like 20 people. And there were not many people being Very, hired. very, and it was the Cold War peace dividend, mm -hmm. and it was like uh, everything is over and we don't have problems. And So yeah. you were part of that yes. cohort in a sense. Yeah. So after I entered the agency, I <clears throat> ended up applying for an HR role in organizational development, even though that had nothing really to do with my academic background, I just happened to f work in a couple of jobs um, that those skill sets applied. So I ended up getting hired and then made my way into the analyst side of the house. And in 99, there were relatively few women at the agency, really, right? I mean, compared to like... Well... I mean, although they were not... I mean, a lot of them were working terrorism, right? Because that was seen as... Right. Well, on the analyst side, there I found a lot more gender equity. Okay. I didn't see the disparity between... Um, the numbers like I did on the operations side later when I joined the ops side. Yeah, and there was a whole cohort of people that, that, uh, that Barbara Sood and right. Gina Bennett and yes. uh, Jennifer, Cindy Storer. Cindy Storer. Tell us about Jennifer Matthews. Jennifer Matthews. Tell us about these people and how you met them and what they were doing. And They were part of that initial core um, analyst group that was focused on and um, looking at Al-Qaeda. They had been, many of them had been looking at Al-Qaeda since um, the early to mid 90s. Yeah, Gina wrote the first uh, paper, paper essentially. about bin Laden, a guy called yes. bin Laden in 93. Right? Yes. Uh, and Gina was still in. Yeah. Uh, and then Barbara Sood had, is a PhD in Arabic medieval thought, which turned out mm -hmm. to be quite useful suddenly. Exactly. Um, and Cindy uh, was one of the first to kind of put the organization together. Put the organization yep. together. And then, of course, that, well, and tell us also about Jennifer Matthews because. Uh, and Jennifer um, was part of that cohort. She functioned as an analyst for a while and then she eventually um, worked on the operations side as well. Um, she had been looking at Al Qaeda for a very long time. So she was part of that first inception of that group. Um, Jennifer was uh, later killed at Coast, which is why you might recognize her name at this point. But, yeah, how did, how did that happen? Um, I mean, I was not in CTC by then, so I ended up getting a phone call that night um, to tell me what had happened. But there was a source that uh, they were recruiting that had actually brought evidence that he could get close to senior Al-Qaeda leadership. And it was, there was a decision made across the board, even at headquarters, that we were going to treat this guy with kid gloves, and then he entered the compound and wasn't searched and um, blew, himself, blew up. himself up and killed, killed several, several people. people. Yeah. Um, but now, is it true that Mike Scheuer, had, who founded the Bin Laden unit, had a sign outside his door saying, no, no men apply? Well, or is that a kind of apocryphal <laughs> Mike Scheuer story? I, I, that might might be a Scheuer story. <laughs> I, I'm not really sure. But Mike has told me that it, basically he much preferred you know, like hiring women. And there were well, a lot of women in the Bin Laden. But Alex Station was a really separate entity yeah. from the analysts. So like yeah. Cindy Storer and Barbara Sud and Gina were in a completely different building and in a completely different department. They were yeah. not even part of that operations piece. So you were, you were focused on jihadi terrorism writ large rather than sort of the Bin Laden focus? Or what was your... I later, when I joined CTC, I joined CTC right after 9-11. Um, my what is CTC? Oh, sorry, Counterterrorism Center. I still do that using all this. Yeah, <laughs> it's important to well, right? like everybody in this room knows, but like <laughs> we should just have a conversation entirely with, with acronyms about NCTC yeah, and could. CTC and go all day. the ODNI and. <laughs> <laughs> so, but my role really was in Counterterrorism Center. Um, I moved from a different analytic unit. Was charged with looking at whether or not Iraq had anything to do with 9/11 and Al Qaeda. Mm. And ultimately, our bottom line was that it did not. Yeah. One, well, of course, Vice President Cheney was pushing that for. I mean, yes. there was even. I mean, if you, you, you'll. This is going to be like a really bad flashback, but let me suggest some some elements of it. So the meeting in Prague, Mohammed Atta was meeting with a yeah. Iraqi intelligence officer right. in Prague, 
Right, and that was actually Tennant relatively quickly discounted that, but yes. Cheney kept publicly talking about it. Right. And he'd say things like, um, well, we can't totally disprove it, and which is, of course, they can't totally disprove anything. Right, exactly. <laughs> you can't totally disprove. Right. It, it's such ridiculous. But so walk us through what was, that, what was that experience like, and obviously there's a lot of pressure from the Bush White House to make this connection. And in fact, Stephen Hayes wrote a book called The Connection, which is all about this putative Iraq Al Qaeda connection that was total BS. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was there was an initial paper, um, the the iteration of the team right before I joined. It was called we called it the Murky Paper because that was mm. part of the title. But it it said it surmised well if there was this connection then therefore this would be the relationship. It didn't have evidence and it didn't say there was. Mm. It said here's our collection gap, but here's here's if that were to happen. That wasn't very helpful because um, it didn't really provide any type of analysis and collection that did, to answer their question. And by the time I joined the team, there was a new branch chief in charge. And she had actually been a briefer for the vice president. So mm. she understood his thought process, could anticipate some of his questions. We started working on an intelligence assessment, which is like a l really long uh, strategic paper on if there was a connection with Iraq. It was basically covering all of Iraq's connections to terrorism. Yeah. And of course, even if you accepted the most um, sky is falling view of that WMD program, you kind of needed this Al Qaeda connection to say that they would give women. The whole theory of the case was they had with WMD right. that they would give to terrorists. Right. So, so <laughs> that was the, pre the supposition. Yeah. Um, Within the context of the larger IA, we did talk, discuss Iraq's connections to some Sunni terrorist groups that were focused on Israel. So they were yeah. not broad global jihadists. That Saddam was giving it. money to families that were uh, Palestinian right. terrorist families. I and mean, he was doing some nefarious Correct. things, but these were not Al Qaeda. Correct. And <clears throat> parts of the administration understood that. Other parts of the administration, like in the vice president's office, in addition to pieces at the DOD under Doug Fife, yeah. We're pushing the narrative of, well, therefore, it could be this Al-Qaeda connection, and look at this nuance yeah. that we found. There's a touch point we can come up with. I mean, the language that they were using on cable news constantly, it would, it would gaslight, essentially, any truth out there. Meaning? Meaning they were, they were drawing a connection that wasn't there yeah. for the public. And the unfortunate thing is the only way to disprove this in any meaningful sense was to invade Iraq. Or declassify the information. <laughs> because when you look at Colin right. Powell's speech, yeah. and he talks about a guy whose name is Abu Musab al Jarkawi, yeah. he was not a member of Al Qaeda, but he was in Herat, Afghanistan, in a training camp next to bin Laden and Al Qaeda. But he had nothing to do with them. They didn't want anything to do with him. He was a riffraff. He was this thug that grew up on the streets in Jordan, had been in and out of prison, and been radicalized. But his goal at that time was the Jordanian kingdom. And he was not looking at global jihad. Mm. Yeah, so were you part of the, Powell came to the agency, right, to scrub some of this material before the UN speech? Well, <laughs> I just went over this with Mike Morrell because I was just on a podcast with him. Yeah. Um, actually, the, the Powell, route that this takes is yeah. we all write our pieces, yeah. deliver those to the, to the White House so that they have our analysis and our bottom line. After that, that's thrown away. Speechwriter re rewrites what they want to say. When we get it back and see it, it's drawing a, a clear connection. Yeah. So Phil Mudd then takes the mantle and starts uh, rewriting the speech again. But there's still, at the end of the day, left in there um, this, this language around Zarqawi and around Iraq that makes it sound like there is a connection. Uh, well, I mean, I remember listening to the speech and thinking, wow, if this is true, this is really big. And there's a particular moment where Powell says, that members of Al Qaeda had gone to Iraq for training on weapons of mass destruction. I mean, right. he's basically Which we said, from our perspective, completely bogus. And this is, a, this is a source they're trying to pull and use for both sides of the story, right? For WMD and Al Qaeda. And we said, yeah. this piece is not true. But some of this was coming from Al Libby, who had also been tortured. Right. 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 In fact, he was making it up. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the agency has actually changed, I think, quite a lot. As, I mm -hmm. mean, what are the. Which year did you leave? I left in 2010. Okay, so what were the, as a result of this total fiasco, what, what were the things the agency did to kind of make that a lot less likely? I mean, some of these techniques were used in the bin Laden hunt, 
to, to mm -hmm. write in terms of, so tell us a little bit about how the agency changed the way it did business. I think it changed the way that they functioned as far as um, some of the analysis that was done on the WMD side, there were, there are processes in place to, to prevent that. It's, yeah. They just weren't used correctly, I would say. Yeah. Um, but more red teaming, more alternative yes. explanations, more. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, and of course, one of the, I mean, in the Bin Laden, uh, Mike Morrell, mm -hmm. you know, was, because he lived through this fiasco, uh, tended to have a much lower degree of confidence that bin Laden was in Abbottabad than other people who were following bin Laden, you know, as, right. as, as a full-time matter. Because, and in fact, at one point, Mike Morrell told President Obama that the circumstantial evidence that bin Laden was living in Abbottabad was less good than the circumstantial evidence that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, which is kind of a interesting. So, so you go through this. What was that experience like? This, I mean, when, when you saw Powell's speech, what did you think? It was confusing because it wasn't. It didn't align with the analysis that we gave the White House or the administration. Yeah. Um, I I was I wasn't privy to all the intel that was behind yeah. the WMD story, but I knew that the our pieces, our shared pieces, were not vetted information that we agreed with. Yeah. Uh, so we go to war. Yes. Uh, and where are you, where are you when the war begins? I ended up um, volunteering to go to Iraq. So I think I was the second person from our team that that went. So you arrived when? Uh, it was at the end of May 2003. Okay, uh, very early. And the insurgency was just beginning. Yeah, uh, we were seeing signs of it because we were then, by then, the military had starting, started to put together this general population prison um, on Baghdad airport. All the regime officials that they had found at that point were um, in cells. And how did the insurgency, what, 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 how, how did the insurgency begin? Well, we, I mean, we know now that Zarqawi had started doing some bombings, some smaller level uh, scale bombings, in addition to some of the bigger targets with the UN. Sergio de Mello. And he was killed. And then he bombed a, a prominent Shia mosque yeah. also inside of Iraq. And he did these through sort of what we at the time saw as unprecedented means. It was rolling VBIEDs, which is vehicle bombs that with IEDs attached, basically the vehicle just becomes an IED, and they had several just consecutive after another. And we hadn't seen that yet play Didn't out. he use his father-in-law in one of the first ones? Is that correct? Did in he? one of the first ones, yeah, he which did. Which shows a pretty high level of... Dedication, as yeah. you could call it, well, I guess. Uh, Insanity. After you, uh, you know, <laughs> father-in-law, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, um, I think... I think what was also so surprising at the time is, is just how incredibly callous he was, killing yeah. civilians. That was... I remember you saying that you kind of had to live with this guy. Yeah. And what was that Mentally. Like? What was that sharing like? Sharing space in my head. Um, you know, he's, he, he... I don't think he was crazy. That's the easy way to dismiss an extremist ideology. Um, I was just constantly having to second guess where is he coming from, and what is his agenda, and what is his overall strategy this month? Tell us a little bit about his background. So, I mean, as I said a little bit, he was, he was in and out of prison in Jordan. Uh, he became radicalized in prison because um, he was with a cleric who was an extremist at the time. So I think he found a sense of camaraderie, of belonging. Uh, prior to that, he was doing nothing useful with his life. He just been stealing stuff. He was doing drugs, drinking. He was a thug. He was a thug. So now that he had this purpose um, and this clear goal and this way forward, he really bought into all of that. Mm. And I'm thinking about Joby Warwick's great book, and there's a scene where he's in that jail, and he kind of controls everybody just with the, the mm -hmm. slightest movement of his eye. Yeah. So the, tell us a little bit about his personality and his... Which I think is kind of fascinating. When you look at the comparison between him and bin Laden, who yeah. tries to come off as the professor. I mean, you can tell us what he's like in person. But, um, and whereas Zarqawi was more of a sort of manipulator. He wanted to be the, the godfather of, of his world. He yeah. was kind of a mafia boss. 
Well, and it's in a lot of ways, he's a lot more successful than bin Laden. I mean, in the sense that, yeah. I mean, al-Qaeda in Iraq took over much of Western Iraq, right? In 2000, yes. I mean, you remember the famous marine assessment yep. that Tom Ricks uh, wrote about, like in 2006, they controlled Anbar province. Yeah, they did. Um, now he, and then he ended up pulling all those resources and money away from al-Qaeda central. Uh, so he, he controlled the global jihad at that point. Yeah, and that was thousands of people were joining from around the Muslim world. I mean, it was mm -hmm. sort of ISIS zero, what, I mean, point zero yeah. ISIS. I mean, the, a lot of the ISIS things came out of al-Qaeda in Iraq, whether it was the videos, the, the brutality, the beheadings, right. the, the recruiting of people from around the world, mm -hmm. uh, extreme levels of violence. But this is all Zakawi. Yeah, this is all, all Zarqawi. So even though now the videos look rudimentary, this was kind of a breakthrough in marketing media for... Um, the terrorist groups at the time. Yeah, because I think broadband video had just started. Right? Mm -hmm. in when they executed Nick Berg, was like a million people saw this video. The, yeah. Do you remember when that happened? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. What, um, so tell us about that. So we saw it before it actually hit, I think, most the broader audience of the Internet. And we were trying to, of course, identify who was in the video so we could figure out who his second-in-command was, who were some part of his Shura Council, and who's still inside of Iraq. So we had to watch it. Who was um, Nick Berg, by the way? And Nick Berg was, um, he was a contractor, from what I understood, uh, at the time working inside of Iraq. I think he was largely on his own, though, I like looking for work at the time. And they ended up uh, capturing him. He was a US citizen. And the video itself was a beheading of Nick Berg. Yeah. And in a way, that was Zakawi's kind of yeah, I'm here. Moment. Exactly, his calling card. So you were the main targeter. So tell us, uh, I mean, this, this question of being a targeter, I mean, it's an, this didn't exist before 9-11, right? The, the whole... To a, to, yeah, it did to an extent because there was, okay. so when we talk about Alex Station, yeah. I think technically those jobs were targeting officer I guess jobs. That's there was a, okay. a formality that I think happened after 9-11 around this role, even while I was, when I first entered into the role, they were still building it. I was helping try to help architects sort of what the um, training would look like. Mm. But for me, because I'd been a anal traditional analyst um, and able, able to take that knowledge and apply it to you know, a more tactical position, I think it was incredibly useful. But I did this role because I, I wanted to actually then do something about dismantling and, and affecting the problem inside of Iraq. Yeah. Because Zakawi was really the person who was instigating so much of the violence. Yes. And, I mean, t to the extent that you can, tell us about what, what you did in, in terms of finding him. I mean, as far as this, this role goes, we're looking at information that comes in from everywhere. So you're doing something that's similar to a traditional analyst where you're trying to find the salient pieces of information and vet those, vet those pieces of information and turn them around very quickly so they can be operationalized by an action arm, which in this case was special forces. Yeah. Did you deal with Mike Flynn? I met Mike Flynn. Yeah. Yes. Because he was the intel uh -huh. guy in JSOC at the yeah. time, yeah. Um, and eventually, what, what happened? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> with Mike Flynn? No, no, not Mike Flynn. <laughs> sorry, it was Zakawi, sorry. Um, there were a couple times where we actually had uh, intelligence about where he would be. Um, I go into at least two of those in my book. Yeah. And we were, at one point, we were right behind him. Because so you, you need to know where he's going to be, not, not necessarily right now, but like where he might be in a few hours. Right. right. If, if you're going to. Right. It's not good enough to know, well, you know exactly where he is right now. That may not be good enough. Exactly. Well, it depends. Depends on the situation. How quickly you can harness resources, yeah. but sometimes the machine of, you know. The bin Laden, when, I mean, the pre 9 11 bin Laden, they, they you know, not, it, it wasn't good enough to know where he was right now. Right. The it took machine a while. took a while, on that, but yes. by the time you're in Iraq, the machine is much quicker. It's, it depended on what it was. So if we, to get boots there, it was a lot faster. Yeah. To harness any kind of air power, it took a little bit longer. Um, but we did have surveillance on two individuals that we now know was Zarqawi. Um, we, had a, we had human intelligence that told us when he would be uh, leaving one point and heading to another destination. Mm. So 
we could see through um, surveillance footage on a drone, because we didn't have an armed drone in there, um, where this white pickup was leaving from and heading to. And so we were pretty confident it was him. And Special Forces was probably about a half a mile behind at that time. But unfortunately, the ISR, the visual coverage, wasn't great at that point. The technology wasn't there. So when he drove into like a tree canopy, we lost sight. And he ended up getting out of the pickup and running, but we couldn't tell which direction because we couldn't see what was happening. So by the time Special Forces arrived, um, it was too late, but they actually captured a laptop that was in the truck. And the, I mean, it's widely been, it's been widely <clears throat> reported on about the, the what, 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 how he was found was through his religious advisor. Right. Which so is, more human intel. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did that happen? So the, <laughs> the irony of my story, three months prior to Zarkawi being killed, I actually transitioned to another job within operations at the CIA. And I was in a different role. And when I found out that he was killed, I was actually on a work trip with colleagues. Standing, I came down into a lobby in there, <laughs> and like grabbing me, you know, look at the news, look at the news. And I happened to see, that's how I found out that they had killed him. And did it seem like the end of an era? I mean, did it seem like a big, it, must have, it seemed like a big deal at the time. It felt like relief to me, but yeah. it didn't feel like a big deal. I mean, yeah. we saw the evolution of what happened after bin Laden, but we'd already, we knew Al-Qaeda didn't go away. Yeah. Um, I, I, I didn't have any great sense of comfort that, that his entire organization was just going to fall apart. Yeah. He had several people on his bench. Yeah. Were you Lots surprised how well they did? I mean, uh, like in the mm. 2014 time period? I mean, here it's... Not necessarily. Look yeah. at how much time they had to hone that skill set. Yeah. From 2003 to 2014, I mean, they had been training that entire time, essentially. Yeah. Do you think if we had stayed in some shape or form at the end of 2011, uh, things might have been different? I mean, meaning if there was some vestigial U.S. military presence, the Iraqi military wouldn't have just collapsed as it did? Uh, I don't. That's a hard question. Yeah. It's counterfactual. It didn't yeah. happen. Um, so if we kill Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, what is the meaning of that? Depends on what his successor looks like. It yeah. depends on um, if there is somebody that can pick up that mantle and, and still galvanize that kind of support. Because we see them doing essentially the same thing Al-Qaeda did, where they're splintering off, um, shunting resources, and claiming attacks in other places like the Congo, which that, you know, that's a tenuous connection because there was already an organization there doing that kind of, kind of... Why did you leave the agency? I left because at the time my husband didn't work for the government. It's, it's a hard... Um, on the operations side, it's just sort of a hard role to have a spouse who doesn't work there because you're having to move consistently. It's hard for them to have a career. Yeah. Um, and so it's just the right time for me to go. Uh, do you any nostalgia? Yeah, I mean, I miss the I miss my friends. Yeah. I miss the ability to, you know, be involved in something that's yeah. contributing to our national security mission. Um, I don't think I miss the bureaucracy at times. <laughs> now, you were, uh, you mentioned the film that you were in, uh, Manhunt. And, uh, oh, you've heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a very interesting moment where you t talk about, um, there's a rather important moment in the hunt for bin Laden, which mm -hmm. you were part of. So tell us about that. Al-Qaeda kept trying to control uh, what Zarqawi was doing in there, because he obviously was ignoring any kind of messaging that they were sending back and forth. There's a lot of arguments in fighting. And Zarqawi just was wanting to foment any kind of chaos, and Al-Qaeda was trying to get him reined in and focus on foreign entities and not killing Iraqi civilians. So they would keep sending messages in or emissaries, and thankfully we kept figuring it out. And the emissaries were going in basically saying, knock it off. Stop killing the Shia. I mean, they were really kind of trying to control them. Yeah, to a certain extent. I, I have this like quasi theory. I really do wonder what would have happened if um, we had not picked up um, Abdul Hadi al Iraqi. I wonder if he would have tried to take over the organization and if it would have functioned differently. Oh, so he might have been going in to kind of yeah, try I and don't, take. Yeah, because he had the Iraqi connection, right? Yeah. He's, he's from there. He's, he's got, I don't know. That's just. That's well, t tell us about him and, and what he to the extent that you can about what he said. He's, a, he's an Al-Qaeda central member, and he, when we figured out he was heading into Iraq, um, ended up arresting him. But 
in Kurdistan. Yes, but because he's from Iraq, I did, I did wonder if he could change the... So what did he say that was so important about the hunt for bin Laden? Well, that was Hassan Ghul. So that was the oh, other okay, emissary. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm confusing the two. Yeah, yeah. so Hassan Ghul was just this low-level Al-Qaeda member at the time. And they sent him in because there had been so many people picked up prior to that. I'm sure they probably figured he was like the expendable character on Star Trek. So <laughs> <laughs> he, he was sent in, and we caught him also in Northern Iraq. Yeah. Um, he ended up talking very quickly. Uh, with the Kurds, um, telling us all sorts of information they haven't asked about bin Laden. The and Kurds uh, don't employ coercive interrogations, or they do? It was not a situation where it was necessary. Right, he, he was, was talking. Yeah, he was talking. He was scared. Yeah. Um, and there were agency personnel there, too. So uh, part of this questioning, of course, was around Al-Qaeda Central, since that's where he came from. And he started talking about the courier. The Kuwaiti. The Al-Kuwaiti. Uh, what did he What did he say about him? He well, he spilled the beans on um, his nom de guerre. Uh, the yeah, the and that, and that there was a courier, yes. and that he was important. That he, yes, and that, and he, that was, he was important. That he had access, and that he wasn't dead. Right. <laughs> Which is an important because yes. there was some just, there was some question about did he die at Tara Bora? Right. Um, so how do you come down on this question of your form, many of your former colleagues say that coercive interrogations were really useful. Um, some are skeptical. The FBI is highly skeptical. Ali Soufan, for instance, and others. But where do you come on down on that? I don't, um, I purposely didn't make a declarative statement in the book, but I talk about my experiences with some detainees, and I talk about experiences and information that we received from, from the CIA detainees. But I think the question isn't necessarily, does it work? Because I don't even know if you can answer that. How do you answer if torture works? Um, there's some people who will never give you information no matter what you do. Yeah. And there's other people who are willing to talk with coercive efforts that don't require torture. Yeah. So I think the bigger question is, who do we as a country and what do we want to represent? Well, that is forward? a very good question. That's a very good question. And I think, ultimately, it's how do we want to conduct ourselves? And I, you know, I think it's interesting. I, I, th I have a private theory, which I'll run by you, see if you, about this. I think a lot of the people who said, yeah, let's do coercive interrogations and watch too many movies. Um, because in the movie, you like, you know, wrap somebody up and they tell you everything. But like, the people who are most opposed, there were no, there were no federal judges, there were no FBI agents. The, the people making these decisions had act no experience of actually how you get information from anybody. Are you talking about the contractors? That well, built I, the no, either the contractors, but people in the White House. I mean, like, because right. I mean, you know, you, the most effective interrogation technique is usually, you, do you want to diet coke? Not, right. you know, I'm going to like put the screws on you. Right. So I think, Lord knows why they thought that was going to be useful, yeah. right? I mean, I, I do think they were resorting to this is what this knee jerk reaction to 9 11. This is the immediate need. Um, when I talked to Marty Martin, he yeah. said, you know, even when that program was first put together, the intent was to never use it beyond like KSM and whoever else was the main targets for 9 11. Yeah. They never even thought the concept of using that in a prolonged uh, Explain term. who Marty Martin is. Oh boy, Marty Martin. <laughs> he is. Um, he was a longtime case officer at the CIA in the Counterterrorism Center. He's also in the documentary Manhunt. Um, he's quite the character, but he was brought back to headquarters in charge of um, dealing with finding Al Qaeda and ensuring that there was not another operation right after 9/11. Yeah, speaks Arabic. Yes, he speaks Arabic. And he, he's Dial, a, various dialects of Arabic. He's yeah. And he's a he he's a kind of classic operations officer. Yes, he it, is. And how would you define that classic operations officer? They call themselves the fighter pilots. I see them more as I better. That's just going to be mean if Marty ever hears this. More as a car salesman, I guess. <laughs> they have to coerce people to do things that they don't want to do, right? Spy for the United States. Yeah, they have to get people to do things. Yes, that right. So they, they, they have to understand you know, the process of how another person thinks, what their vulnerabilities are. Leverage. Yes, leverage. And how do they differ from analysts? Oh, analysts are the smarter side of the house. <laughs> 
analysts are, their primary um, focus is digesting all of the information that's coming in from various sources, not just the case officers, but foreign intelligence organizations, uh, technical collection, just everything, and picking out the salient pieces and then writing that up for the policymaker or briefing it to the policymaker. So they're really at the, I think they're, they're kind of at the culmination of the pointy end of the spear because they're taking all the information that the offsides bring. And the Bin Laden unit was unusual because it had both. Right? Well, Alex Station was built around the ops piece, yeah. and it didn't have analysts. It had analysts okay. who left the DI to really just kind of support that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's open it to questions. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Warren? Can you hold one second just because we've got to get a microphone to you, I think. Uh, Warren also starred in a movie, which was great. What was the name of the movie? Shock and Awe. Shock and Awe, if anybody hasn't seen it. Um, going back to the pre-Iraq invasion period, um, I don't know if this is addressed in the book, but when you were under pressure and your fellow analysts to make a connection between Saddam and Al-Qaeda, um, what was the posture of the senior leadership at the CIA, Lieutenant McLaughlin? Were you given any political cover? Were they trying to straddle, um, keep both sides happy? I don't know, can you talk about that? Thank you. I mean, I, have, I certainly have more empathy for them now. Uh, at the time, when you're feeling all of this pressure, you don't exactly know how much they're pushing back. And I do um, understand um, that Jamie Missick did push back when Scooter Libby did not like our paper, our the large intelligence assessment I was just talking about that we submitted that said that there was no connection. Libby said, retract that. And Jamie <laughs> said, I won't. You know, and she said, I will quit over this. So there, there, we did have top cover within management. But nonetheless, Tennant but, sat behind Powell during that presentation, which right. was a kind of way of baptizing it. So he is a political appointee, right? He's yeah. the only political appointee um, at the agency, whereas the rest were career officers. So the other unique piece of this is my branch chief was in a very odd position, right? Our branch is created based on a political question and not intelligence derived. Our branch chief also had experience briefing uh, the White House, so she had a connection already. So we had a direct link that a traditional branch wouldn't normally have. And of course, Warren was one of the few people writing skeptically about all yeah. this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad we did. <laughs> well, history, you know, still yet to be written precisely. Colonel Willie, our Army fellow, whose last day it is, unfortunately, today. Or... Hi, I'm Dennis Willie, and as Peter said, I've been a military fellow here at New America for the last uh, since Labor Day. <clears throat> Your experience bridged, I'm going to talk a little theory really quickly and a lot of data analytics. You were at the front end of what the Pentagon was looking at as a revolution in military affairs back in the early 2000s. And it was all about using tons and tons of data, tons and tons of sensors to lift the fog of war. And then a lot of that got thrown out because Iraq proved that we couldn't determine what was going on. Can you? And then my experience here this year there are a lot of people talking about data analytics, lifting all of these unsolvable problems. Right. Could you comment about, from your perspective, how, that, how you experienced that, and then a little commentary on whether you think that that still has merit today? I think data science has merits in that it's able to maybe be like a first cursory layer cut through information. It doesn't solve analysis. That takes a human. AI is not there yet. I mean, all you have to do is look at the feed in social media, uh, and you can see the, the way that you're targeted. Some of the, the ads and stuff that come up for you, you're probably thinking, well, why would you be advertising that for me? You know, I had, like, boys' underwear targeted toward me, and I haven't <laughs> bought any lately. So <laughs> um, it's, not perf it's not a perfect science. It doesn't work the same way that a human mind does, but it's a good first cursory layer. And I think the mistake that always happens, especially um, if you don't pair an analyst with the data scientist, you're in for a world of hurt because it always ends up with this mess at the end. Well, I mean, that kind of really does raise a very good question, which you lived, which is like, I mean, we had more 
computing power and data science and the history of mankind at the beginning of the Iraq War, but we lost, we were losing in 2005 yes. because we didn't understand what was happening. Right. Right? And then Zikawi was a very good exemplar of what we just didn't understand. I mean, the way he was fighting, how he was working, where he was. Right. Yeah, I mean, all, yeah, the deluge of all that information and, like, all the docx that, that was coming in from different sites, you know, it's just a lot of it was chaff. And that's, that's the difficult part, is just getting through that, that intense amount of information. And I think that's where um, algorithms are helpful, if you feed them the right way. Because again, that has to be driven by a human to be able to position it so that it's pulling what you need. Now, one of the innovations that was the DOCX exploitation became a lot quicker, right? It, yes, it did. It was a lot quicker, but it was a morass. And there's probably stuff that nobody still looked at, I would think, at this point. Because, I mean, there were, like, grocery lists in this stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Do laundry. Right. <laughs> Sean Naylor. Hi. I'm Sean Naylor from Yahoo News. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your fight over the redactions. Um, sort of just a little bit more detail about what, what type of information uh, the government, various departments, were so focused on keeping out. Was, was JSOC more of a problem for you than the agency, actually? And, and how different does the book as published uh, look from your original manuscript? Mm -hmm. uh, Sean, of course, has written a book about JSOC. Yes, he has. <laughs> um, well, the first clue is I don't get to use the term JSOC in ah. the book. So. <laughs> So what do you call <laughs> they it? They don't exist. Um, special Forces. Special Forces, got it. At first it was Special Forces, then I turned it into Special Operations Forces, because I still have friends that work there, and I was thinking they don't want to be called that either. Right. So I, I would say 30% um, of the book was probably, well, 10% of the book was completely removed. Um, another 25% was changed. I don't know. I really tried to get around sort of the, you know, and, and put in the nuance, of, essentially, of stuff I had to remove. And I think, for the most part, it stayed intact. But the problem with the review process is that the agencies don't have, in their reciprocal agreements, end dates. So the CIA couldn't say to DOD, you have to send it back by this date. Mm. But I also, as a former employee, I have no ability to compel them to sit down and talk about the book. I had to file the lawsuit just so I could get to that point. Who, who helped you? I mean, was a, who's your lawyer? Mark Zaid. Well, he's, I was thinking it might be. Yes. So Zaid has had a lot of exper experience right. to, with, with them. Yes. And so did they sort of fold quickly, or did they fight, or what did they do? Um, thankfully, the review process had been taken over at the CIA by a woman who was an analyst. Ah. And she was cleaning up the backlog, the entire process. She... Uh, with DOJ compelled everybody to sit down with me and talk through it. So when I sat down with, with the agency, it was a very easy review. Uh. Went through, you know, agreed on other changes, did the same thing with the other agencies. DOD's was a lot longer meeting, if that gives you any other hints. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> it was a lot longer meeting with lots of colonels, lieutenant colonels, and I think a general <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> but they also, I mean, and did the book suffer, do you think, because of these redactions, or were you able to make it work? I was able to make it work. So if I wouldn't have had those meetings, no way would have I had a book. Um, but I was able to talk through what my rights as an individual and private citizen are, in addition to some of the things that they were taking out were just ridiculous. I noticed in McChrystal's book, he refers to blue and green, which is clearly Delta Force and Navy. I so do that you do too. that as well, OK. Yeah. So and then you co-wrote this with Davin Coburn. How was, how was that experience? So my co-author back here, Davin, um, it was, it, I needed him big time because I've never written a book before and the, I was not super excited about writing about myself. I really yeah. started out thinking I was going to write this about sort of all the other women that were starting out in CTC. Who you do talk about. I do talk, yes, I do talk about. Um, and ultimately the publishers were interested, well, why don't you just tell your, you know, personal story. So. I needed somebody who, A, would keep me on task, <laughs> B, understood how to structure a book, because yeah. I 
that was new to me too. Yeah. And um, he's a good storyteller. Did so you enjoy the stuck, process or was it like pulling teeth? Uh, did you enjoy the process? <laughs> I think you should ask him. <laughs> um, no, he was, he was fantastic. It, I don't know. It, again, writing about yourself is completely different than writing about a subject matter. Now that you've written one, would you write another? If it, yes, because I think this would be the hardest book to write for me. Yeah. Um, and how has it been received? It, the pub date was Tuesday. It was Tuesday. I, uh, so far, so good. What have you... What? I, I read the Kirkus review and... Oh, well, that's good. That's great. What do they say? Um, I guess for them, it was really good. Great. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, but it's an, amazing, it's an amazing piece of work. Uh, any other questions? Okay, we've got, got David and Clark. Thanks. Um, David Sturman here at New America. And uh, some of the women in the audience need to ask a question as well, by the way. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your understanding from your experience of the Al-Qaeda at this time's command and control. And in particular, I want to throw two sort of debates, I guess, are sort of ongoing to you on that. One is um, what what's your sense of how to understand um, Al-Qaeda messages and pipelines through Iran? Was Iran collaborating, not collaborating? And then the second on the other end is Al-Qaeda in Iraq and sort of successor groups when they changed their name. What was their existing, not existing nature of command and control to um, attacks outside of Iraq and particularly in the West? The first one, Iran, Al Qaeda. What was the nature of well, that? Well, didn't you just write something about this? <laughs> I didn't. I, I mean, we we published a paper about it. But, but you don't want to get. You don't need to go there. If well, you want. I mean, from my perspective, when you know, at the time, we understood Iran to be holding um, senior Al Qaeda Al Qaeda members, large part how we would. It was to make sure that they weren't sowing chaos inside of their country, in addition to having leverage. For a possible deal with us. For a possible deal with the United States at the time. Um, but are you talking about current Al-Qaeda command and control or way back then? Um, I'm just wondering to the extent that you can remark on it, understanding the sort of I, challenges of that, um, particularly that sort of period where you were um, oh, right. tracking them. So I, uh, you know, I left the agency so in 2010. And I would say with an organization like Al-Qaeda, I couldn't confidently sit up here and say, I know exactly how they're functioning because they're a covert organization. I know how much information you can find publicly versus what you can find through classified means. And there's a lot more visibility when you have a security clearance into co covert organizations. So I preface that with, um, but I don't, I've never bought the whole analogy of that Al-Qaeda is down and out. I, it's an extremist ideology that has been around long enough yeah. um, that enough people are still embracing it and, it, and it's still a viable organization with a brand. And yeah. those two things, I think it's hard to you know, completely get rid of it. Um, but their command and control versus how Zer Kelly functioned, they were much more hierarchical. I mean, he, he started out as that loose network pulling from the Levant, the Maghreb, he really, even out of the caucuses, he really wanted people to have this sense of empowerment. He was empowering his employees to make decisions. Sounds like a great boss. Yeah, wouldn't he be fantastic? Um, so, the, yeah, the network cell leaders were able to do that themselves, decide what their target was going to be and mm. how soon they were going to conduct that operation. So he continued to, to operate kind of in that manner, but he had a sure council and had a more formalized structure after joining al-Qaeda. Did you have, did you, second part of the question was answered or not? I think it was C2. Yeah? Uh, on that, I, I guess I was wondering, there is, in sort of understanding where ISIS is now, where we know there was a very direct sort of high, the highest end of command and control attack in the West, was that, like, to your understanding, sort of a new thing for them under ISIS, or was there attempted an analogous sort of efforts for um, attacking the West in yeah. sort of the 2000s from 
I'll sort try of to interrupt. AQI specifically. I not. mean, AQI had been attacking coalition forces, and the UN was one of their first large yeah. bombings. Yeah. Talk. Hi, I'm Clark Reeves. Uh, I work for the Fellows Program here at New America. Uh, thank you for your time today. I'm really looking forward to reading your book. My question is, um, when it comes to Colin Powell's speech and mentioning Zarqawi, how much, in your opinion, and to the degree that you feel comfortable sharing, was that a catalyst or a chicken and egg situation for kind of his comeuppance and ultimate success? Huh. Hmm. Well, I don't know how to answer that. Um, Probably his first time that his name had been used publicly somewhere. It was, yeah, that's, that kind of, it brought him to this, you know, global stage where he had not been on before. He was, the agency had been tracking him since the 90s, but he hadn't ever been a player outside of attacking the Jordanian kingdom. And, try, and that was his main priority since he grew up there in Zarqa. Um, by the time Colin Powell's speech came out, uh, I have no doubt the impact it had on him, let alone the network he was trying to recruit from. He clearly had more resources, given what he was able to do right after the invasion. Did we, by the way, that whole thing, it was, um, there was a CIA officer in northern Iraq, this is all public and I'm spacing on his name, but <clears throat> they were tracking this WMD cell, mm -hmm. I think you write about it in the book. So we knew that there was this very crude WMD cell in northern Kurdistan but we didn't tell us about what we didn't do. So Zarqawi, when he was co-located with another group called Ansar al-Islam in, in northern Iraq, he was building this like really rudimentary poisons lab, doing testing on animals, and um, most of which wasn't productive. It didn't work most of the time. I think they ended up killing one of their own, possibly. I can't remember now. Um, they did a lot of stupid stuff. But they, they had the crude bio... Um, weapons lab yeah. in northern Iraq. We knew where they were because this wasn't a mobile lab. Um, <laughs> and we had visibility on the target, but the decision was made then to not act prior to the invasion. Uh, and the reason being? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, but I mean, if we were to speculate. If, well, if I was to speculate, uh, I mean, I think there's probably a variety of reasons. There could have been some legitimate pushback around, do we want to really start taking kinetic action inside of Iraq at this point if we're not ready? Um, I think, on the other hand, having Zarqawi alive was kind of convenient. Yeah. Other questions? This lady here. <clears throat> Hi, Sarah Schaefer from Balance Global. I was wondering, do you have any advice for young female analysts in the CT field, specifically those entering the IC? Hmm. Don't work for David Gartenstein Ross. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I highly recommend it as a career path. I loved being an analyst. Um, I'm hoping that this book spurs more interest uh, for women to, to join the agency and, and the IEC writ large. I think one of the most important things that I learned is don't compromise yourself as a woman um, for any of the roles that you take because it was easy to do moving into the operations side because there weren't as many women and it was still a much more misogynistic culture. Um, Has that changed? I think it's probably changed a little bit. It, uh, we have a woman that now heads the agency in yeah. addition to a woman who's ahead in charge of operations side. Hmm. Um, but the cultural shift, that takes a while, you know, yeah. in any organization. That's, that's much more difficult. But again, the analyst side, I didn't experience that. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. Hi, my name is Leah Crowder. I'm an intern here at New America, and I've been working on um, youth militant recruitment in Syria and Turkey primarily. But I was wondering what, in your opinion, made Zarqawi different from the average kind of economically disadvantaged thug um, who gets pulled into these organizations and what led to his rise? I think that's the ultimate golden question, right? Is what makes an individual become radicalized. And I don't think we still have, with all the research that's been done, the perfect answer to that. Like what makes one person join versus another? Because even people that are on 
the, the spectrum of extremism, we don't know what propels some to become violent and others never engage in violence, but they hold those beliefs. So I think for an easy take would be my guess. Um, he didn't really have anything else going for him. This seemed to be <laughs> a sense of purpose. He seems to fall in that category, if I were to guess. You mentioned that you are working for tech platforms and social media kind of keeping illicit content off. Is that, I mean, cause, so is that related to your past work in some shape or form? Um, yeah, I mean, once you work on a problem set with extremism, you're yeah. able to identify and work with and, and, you know, deal with other forms of extremism, whether it's hate groups, yeah. um, terrorism in the sense of the, how the American government classifies it, which hopefully there's an evolving mindset around that as well. Yeah. Um, or any criminal organization. Gentleman here. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jack Krapeski, unaffiliated. Um, can you give us some color on, was KSM on your, how, to what degree was KSM on your radar in the run up to 9-11? especially with his familial connection to Ramzi Yosef. And also the uh, August report in 2001 about Al-Qaeda was uh, expected to attack America with yeah. airplanes. How, the, it, whether there's any color there you can provide. And, that, and it, is a, it is a fact that is publicly known that Barbara Sood, who we mentioned, who was the medievalist, uh, wrote that report, August the 2nd. And I, I was not in, in the counterterrorism center right prior to 9-11, but... From what we know now at this point, um, they were aware of KSM as being part of Al-Qaeda, that was your question. But they were surprised when they found out he was the operational commander of 9-11. Right. That's what I found out doing your documentary. <laughs> <laughs> um, other questions? Gentleman here. Yeah, I wanted to ask about Dick Cheney and um, how he led us into war. How, how do we prevent that from happening in the future? How do we prevent what from happening? Going like, into war. Being, being into wars. Being bamboozled. Um, I think that was when we first started seeing, uh, <laughs> without even referencing it, right, the inception of politicians weaponizing words to manipulate the American public in a way that I'm not sure we've really seen on that scale before. Well, I mean, 1890. Okay. I mean, I mean, I feel like Cuba. <laughs> Cuba, okay. The I'll USS you that. Maine. I mean, it's, it's, it's <laughs> we'll been around. For our a while. lifetime. How's yeah, that? Our, our lifetime. Okay. Um, I knew as soon as I said that, it's like, oh, of course, there's other instances. <laughs> but uh, I mean, especially in the modern way that we have platforms, right? Yeah. It, it would have taken forever to get that word out and spread it in the same way that we do now yeah. on television, on social media. Um, I personally, as a member of the pu public at this point, when I hear rhetoric about Iran, I'm not anonymous sources in a New York Times piece means nothing to me. Um, I want receipts. I, I would ask for a unclassified or at least declassified as much national intelligence estimate yeah. on the problem set. I want to know exactly how imminent this danger is because even regardless of what the, the CIA and the government got wrong in WMD, there still was not an imminent threat positioned within that yeah. NIE. Um, I, I don't think we should take this lightly. When I think the knee-jerk reaction we keep having to anything that's deemed a threat to the United States or a national security urgency we have to ask lots of questions. If you're asking resources from us, the American public, meaning money and our children, we have a right to know as much as possible. Yeah. Any other questions? With that, we will thank Nada very much. And um, please, she will, she's willing to sign books. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have a, a place for you to sign books. Okay.